Florence, art, architecture, beauty, books. Here are four books that I love set in Florence. There's a treasure hunt through the streets, a friendship that lasts a lifetime, and we get a glimpse of what it's like to be a great artist. Hi everyone, it's Catherine here. Let's dive into the first book, It's Still Life by Sarah Winman. This was my favourite book of 2021. The story starts one night on a deserted road just south of Florence. We are near the end of World War II and by chance Evelyn, this sassy art historian, meets Ulysses, a soldier in the British Army. They head off together in a jeep to an old castle that is being used as a base by the army. I must say, during these first few chapters, I really didn't have a clue about what was going on beyond that fatalistic camaraderie that can build so suddenly when people are thrown into dangerous situations. But the war quickly ends and we end up back in London in a rough and tumble pub called The Stout. And this is where we meet Cole the Publican, Pete the Piano Player, and Cressy. He's, I don't know, like this streetwise philosopher. He's one of my favourites. Add in a talking parrot called Claude, and then Peg. She is Ulysses' wife from a quick pre war marriage. Peg is hmm, one sexy lady full of brashness and bravado, and she is the person that ties this menagerie of friends all together. Once we are hooked on the antics of life at the pub and understand some of the underlying motivations of Ulysses and his friends, we return to Florence in the 1950s. It's a glamorous time as Europe rebuilds. Now we will see if Ulysses can build the type of life in Florence he has always dreamed about. I loved every word of this book. It's full of powerful imagery and strong feelings. I had to read it slowly so I could savour each page. The descriptions of food, art and life in Florence are dazzling. As the story encountered a famous painting or church, I would often pause and Google it to learn a bit more about Florence's spectacular site. A lot of the story is set in the Altano area. That's the bit south of the main river. It's full of centuries old cafes and artisan workshops. And it's so easy to imagine yourself walking down these streets. The story itself is narrated by an unknown person, which sort of made me feel like a bit of an insider with special access to everyone's hearts and minds. By the time I got to the end of this book, I was very sad to leave Ulysses, Evelyn and his friends. Read this if you enjoy stories that focus on the bonds of friendship and finding your place in the world. Our next book is a feel-good read that shows fate can set us on the right path, if we let it, that is. The book is called Three Days in Florence by Chrissy Mamby. Our leading lady is Kathy. She has a perfectly normal existence in the UK, and for a whole life she's grown up in awe of Florence. This all started because her mum and dad went to Florence on their honeymoon. Her parents loved the city so much that they filled her childhood with endless stories about the beautiful buildings, glamorous Italian ladies, and yummy ice cream. They even gave her the middle name of Florence. But weirdly, Kathy has never visited Florence. She has only dreamt about it. Out of the blue, she now has an opportunity to visit the city of her dreams with an invite to a family wedding. She wants to walk the ancient streets and set eyes on those magnificent churches and statues, all for herself. But for some reason, her partner Neil and his three loathsome teenagers are less than happy about the trip. 
they actually look like they're going to ruin the whole experience with their constant whinging and whining. That's when fate intervenes and Kathy is given a choice. Hmm, will she continue to run around after her irritating partner and his rude teenagers, or will she take this opportunity to get the courage to have some fun? This is an enjoyable story, and I really like the journey of Kathy finding her voice, literally. I also like seeing Florence through her first time as eyes, even with hordes of tourists. Whilst the storyline is a bit predictable, to me, that's actually a part of the book's charm. Read this if you're looking for an escape and want to enjoy an uplifting story. Have you ever been mesmerized by Michelangelo's statue of David? the size of the feet, the sinewy muscles, or those delicate curls that frame the face, then this is the book for you. It's called The Giant by Laura Morelli. The author is a talented art historian, and she has reimagined how the most famous sculpture in Florence, the Statue of David, was created. The story is told through the eyes of Michelangelo's childhood friend, Jacopo. Jacopo? Well... He's interesting, he's a bit of a lad, always playing practical jokes, and seems to spend more of his time drinking and gambling than actually working as an artist. Life in Renaissance Florence is never straightforward, and the city elders must approve all works. So first, the friends must bid for the rights on this old block of marble that has been wasting away in a workyard for years. The question is, Will Michelangelo and Jacopo's friendship be strong enough to survive the petty jealousies of artists with big egos, or will their dreams be shattered? What I liked most about this book was to think about someone like Michelangelo as a normal bloke, rather than one of the world's most famous artists. He gets in trouble from his father, sits in the shade by the river, and is always driven by his desire to capture form and shape. The descriptions really jump off the page. As Jacopo tells his story, it's a bit like he has his camera crew from Netflix following him around, doing a documentary on Michelangelo's life, warts and all. This reminded me that great art does not necessarily come from great people. In one particular scene, they all end up at a parade and it reminded me of a balmy summer evening in Florence many years ago. We were walking back from dinner and followed the sound of music down this side street. Then we accidentally ended up in the middle of a celebration. The locals knew what was going on, but us tourists just followed along and enjoyed the excitement, eventually ending up the river for fireworks. It was fun to see the parallels between Michelangelo and Jacopo's world and my real life experience 400 years later. Read this if you enjoy books set in historical times and especially if you're a fan of how artists work. The next book was the top of the bestsellers lists in 2003 and you could not get on a train or a plane without seeing this book tucked under someone's arm. Yes, this is years before Kindles even existed and we had to lug physical books everywhere. The book is Inferno by Dan Brown. You may already know the book or the series or maybe the movie starring Tom Hanks. I recently reread the book and found it just as enjoyable now as all those years ago. The story opens when our hero Robert wakes up in a Florence hospital with no idea whatsoever of how he got there. He's a long way from teaching class at Harvard University in the USA. Soon a lady with spiky hair and a big gun arrives and he flees the hospital with Sienna, a young doctor who is treating him. They escape on a motorbike to Sienna's apartment and discover hidden in Robert's pocket puzzle thingy that reveals an image of famous painting. Can you get where I am going with this book? 
The action is non-stop. The painting in the puzzle is based on Dante's poem of the seven levels of hell. Nerdy but lovable Robert is a professor of symbology and he quickly figures out that this version of the painting holds a secret message. Now the hunt is on. Where do the clues lead? Who created the puzzle? And who is trying to kill him? This book is a breathless race against time thriller. It's totally unbelievable, but with plenty of unexpected twists, it will keep you thoroughly entertained and wanting more. I love the pace and how Robert gives you a bit of an art history tour of the most beautiful places in Florence, all while he is running away from baddies. From the Plaza Vecchio's secret passages to the hidden parts of the Boblio Gardens, it's just like you are there. Towards the end of the book, the action moves on to Venice and Istanbul, but the story is always grounded back in Florence through Dante's poem. A warning though, the storyline includes a potential plague being released by a supervillain. If that is a bit much for you at the moment, then give this one a miss. Gee, how innocent we were when we used to think plague storylines were far-fetched. This book is number four in a series where the lovable professor solves mysteries through his knowledge of symbols and art, whilst whilst traipsing through the best cities in the world. You don't need to read the earlier books, all can be read independently. To write this book, the author spent months living in Florence. Oh, what a hardship. He researched the city extensively, and this gives an authentic tone to all the details. I think he does a great job of representing the cities he writes about and has really popularised the destination writing as a genre. The success of this author means this book is available in many different languages. Read this if you want to suspend reality and go on a treasure hunt through Florence. To me, there is something special about just being in Florence. I don't know, is it the light, the architecture, the Prosecco? I don't know, but it's a place where just being there is enough. And these books definitely take you to Florence. Links to all the books and extra content about secret passages and Michelangelo are in the description below. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode set in some wonderful part of the world. I'm toying with the idea of Iceland. This playlist has all the past episodes of book reviews, including Malta, Tokyo, Sydney, and more. Do you have some travel loving or book obsessed friends? Sh then share this video with them now and treat them to a book tour of Florence. See you next time.